Welcome to the online release of our book, The Secret Balance of Champions, Health Challenges in Elite Sport. It's just amazing to see what the result can be of one and a half year hard work. It can also be challenging these days due to COVID. And therefore, we are really thankful for the possibility one of our partners gave us. We are at the headquarters of the Football Players Worldwide FIFPRO in Amsterdam here and in the Netherlands, and we rebuilt this lobby into a really nice TV studio, just to give you the best experience in this live stream. And you know what? I just heard from our producer that you are with so many of us, like our champions in our book. Welcome to you. And also our experts in the book. You're also here. Nice that you're here. And also like our partners, the Drake Foundation, Push Sports, FIFPRO and ACES. And our family and friends, also thanks for all your support. And I heard you are from all over the world. Namaskar, India. Bonjour, France. Ciao, Italy. Hello, USA, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Norway. Goedemiddag, South Africa. Goedemiddag, Nederland. And hello to all the others here in the world. That's the positive thing of being online, right? So if you are ready, let's start and let me tell you where it all started. Um, Vincent Gutebars, Gino and Kerkhoff and I started with this amazing project in the summer of 2019. Our plan was to compile a book about the health challenges in elite sport aimed for elite athletes based on medical chapters compiled by some of the best sport and medical experts in the world and uh, also a unique reflection of 32 champions. And I was lucky enough to uh, interview all those champions as an elite athlete myself. And the first interview was in the Olympic capital in the world, in Lausanne, just before COVID um, arrived. And it was with Abhinav Binra. What also happens, I think, in a sports career and with mental well-being is, you know, one is always changing, you know, one's mind is always changing, one's approach is always changing, and it is always a question of adaptability um, and finding that synchronization between mind and body. Um, and at times uh, during my career that was lost. Uh, and then I had issues um, with my mental well-being, but it was again a matter, matter of finding that balance again i come back to i think it's all about balance my sport is all about balance it is about finding balance uh, uh, in the body but it is also equally important to finding that balance in your mind yes it's it's all about balance and that's where we are going to talk about today about the secret balance of champions and we are going to do that with my co-editors, Vincent Gutebars and Gino Kerkhoffs, and also really special, our Dutch football legend, Marco van Basten. And I will introduce them to you later today, because um, yeah, Marco is going to receive the first copy of our book. And he also wrote the, the, the foreword in a book. So it's definitely really special. But we are going to start with three other champions in the book. Let me introduce to you Marianne Timmer, our Dutch former skating queen, and also Levchenko, uh, Evgeny Levchenko, sorry, he's originally from Ukraine and former professional football player. But we are going to start with Zara Gregorius. And Zara is a former professional football player from New Zealand and played 100 caps for New Zealand. Welcome to you, uh, Zara. Thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. Okay. Yeah, for you it's actually a home competition, right? How, how is it here to be here? In the Netherlands, yeah, it's actually 
really interesting. It's been a wonderful experience. I've been here for now about 14, 15 months. It feels like a very long way from home, especially now, as you mentioned, in the COVID times too. So it's actually nice to be able to, I guess, reflect a little bit back on my career back home with you. And obviously through the book, it's, it's really exciting and fortunate in this situation that I can actually be here with you physically and we can have a good discussion today. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, but also Fifth Pro. It's like a, a hometown for you here, right? It is, it is. I'm very familiar with the surroundings as it's the only reason that I'm here in the Netherlands actually to take up an opportunity with Fief Pro. So I feel like I'm at my home away from home. <laughs> yeah, and let's go back to your childhood where it all began. How was your childhood? Yeah, I had a, a wonderful upbringing. I'm a middle child with two brothers either side of me. So I am um, obviously, I don't know if you can see on the live stream, but I'm not the biggest of people. So I had to um, learn very quickly how to compete uh, with my brothers growing up to make up for that. So it was a really happy childhood. We have uh, a wonderful lifestyle in New Zealand where everyone is very active. I spent a lot of time outdoors, lived very close to a local football field and, and that type of thing. So yeah, nothing but happy memories from childhood. And how started it with football? Yeah, I, I actually was a bit of a late bloomer. I think most most people, most professionals particularly start at a really young age. I don't know how it was for Lev, but I was I, I came was oh, I was <laughs> double his age. I was about 12 years old when I started playing football properly, but had played a number of, of sports previously, but Yeah, I was about 11 or 12 years old where a friend of mine introduced me to football and I can actually still to this day really distinctly remember my first game, which was down at the local field and came home and said to my parents, I'm pretty sure I don't want to do anything else and dropped all other sports and decided <laughs> football was for me. And it was in a, in a boys team, right? It was in a boys team. Unfortunately, I think until I was about 15 or 16, I played almost exclusively in boys teams. There was only ever one or two other Uh, girls that played alongside me and uh, that was obviously just the way that it was back then but it's changed a lot now even in New Zealand it's it's a totally different landscape but that was fine for me like I said I had two brothers so I was, I was more than happy to rough and tumble with the boys. Yeah and to make it uh, yeah interactive because this is all welcome to you Lev and uh, Mariana as well. Mariana this also like reminds me to our uh, interview that you also talk about Uh, training with boys. Um, how do you uh, look at yeah at that, or how do you look back at that? Well, I think it's always nice to have a mixed team, uh, boys and girls. It's a different uh, language or different talking. What what uh, what girls and boys do, but I think the mix is, yeah, it, it's nice. It's it's uh, definitely different than only ladies in the team. But uh, in your uh, youth, it was also like a, a goal, right? To yeah, to, to beat the boys, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah. As, as a girl wins from a boy, that is that's double, double party. It's nice. <laughs> you feel good, right? <laughs> yeah. And Sarah, going back to you, like um, the path from your youth to going professional. How was that? I mean, it would be awesome to sit here and say that it was a smooth linear um, journey that I took but no it was it was really up and down and I think early on you have to sort of take risks and back yourself and and it's hard to see sometimes uh, the success doesn't come straight away it can take several years which I think you can <laughs> get a little bit more of an understanding and if you read my chapter in the book Uh, I didn't start playing for the national team until I was well into my 20s at around 22, 23 and not going overseas to play professionally until I was 20, on my 25th birthday actually. So it, c it takes a long time sometimes to see that success. So people are right when they tell you it's a bit of a roller coaster and that was certainly my experience. Yeah, and talking about that roller coaster, maybe it's good to uh, to take a little piece of your chapter uh, next to you because we prepared a little piece uh, out, out of the chapter of, uh, of the book from Sarah. And I want to ask you to uh, read aloud these sentences in your book. Sure. Uh, it was really disappointing and tough because I got injured while training with the national team and I'd been selected to go to Japan prior to the injury. We had a game there and it was my first time being selected for the New Zealand team. People actually think I sustained the injury maybe two or three weeks before we went to Japan, but I had trained through the injury. So two days away from our first game in Japan and what was meant to be my debut, we were training and my knee just collapsed underneath me. 
this was really difficult because I was 22 years old. So I'd waited a long time for this opportunity. And then two days before I was due to make my debut for New Zealand, I had probably one of the worst injuries you can have as a football player. Yeah, it's like emotional, right? Y yes and no. It was certainly emotional at the time. I was devastated. Uh, but looking back now with the uh, benefit of hindsight, I actually think it was kind of a, f a fortunate thing to happen in a way because it taught me a lot about balance, obviously, and it taught me how important it is to maintain a certain level of strength and, and fitness uh, within myself because that was the reason I got injured. I had gone very rapidly from, I guess, training as a as an amateur to trying to train at the elite level and, and my body suffered as a result. So maybe if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't have gone on to have a 10-year long career and, and had all of those good habits ingrained in me around um, sustaining my body and that type of thing so I, I'm a naturally optimistic person so I, I don't want to look back and feel too many negative emotions but I actually do in the long run I did see it as a positive. Yeah well you're saying that it reminds me also uh, to our interview uh, Lev um, you told about the fact that you didn't have any injuries at all right? No that's true I didn't have uh, any uh, big injuries some small ones Definitely, but not, not the big ones, no. So I'm lucky with that, lucky with my body. Yeah, what is your secret in that? Because that, that's amazing, right? <laughs> I don't know, just no secret. I, um, I was training really hard all the time and uh, I think um, I take care of my body actually from, from, from my use. You know, I was always prepared. F you know, when you're thinking about uh, injuries um, and some situations on the field, you think, okay, I could be injured here, but... Um, Oh, I was lucky that I didn't get any any big injuries. Yeah, I think uh, many athletes dream of such a such a career. Yeah, thank you. But um, I think I'm not. I have not uh, not the biggest career what I expected. But um, I'm definitely lucky, and I was especially lucky when I made a choice to come to the Netherlands. Especially, um, I was 18. Um, and I decided by myself to come here. I started to play when I was six um, because of my father. My father was really uh, persistent. He was pushing me actually uh, sometimes and um, he gave me also this special ball, really Lazarus ball and um, I was so happy with that. I slept with this ball and actually from, from that moment um, I thought I'm gonna be a professional football player. I think I was six when I was uh, seven. I said, I'm gonna be a football player. Yeah, wow. We were definitely go coming back to you yeah. about that uh, later in the in this okay. show. And going back to you, uh, Sarah, like talking about, yeah, the, the injury, what it taught you. Um, it's, I think, really interesting. Um, can you tell a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I mean, you have to, Not there aren't, or I mean, unless you're Lev and you have unbelievable luck, there are always going to be tough moments in any sporting career. I don't think it matters the discipline or or even the length of the career. There will, whenever there are highs, there are always going to be lows. So I think you have to find in those low moments the opportunities to learn and to grow, either as an athlete or or sometimes just even as a person, because those lessons can help you throughout the rest of your life. So. Uh, for me, it really was just about m making the most of all of a sudden, I guess, really all of this time to develop other parts of my game where I couldn't develop physically or, or technically because I was, you know, recovering from surgery and that type of thing. So I concentrated a lot on um, learning more about the game tactically, trying to determine whether or not um, I could apply the strengths that I did have in a certain way. How could I get better? How could I sort of insulate myself against injuries of that nature in the future so I think like any moment in life you it's what you make of it right and if you can try and learn some lessons and see some positives then even the dark moments have that little bit of a silver lining yeah, and Mariana how do you uh, listen to this like uh, the positive mindset and and uh, yeah dealing with setbacks how yeah, is that for I, you I think every person has setbacks in their life and at certain points you need to think what can I do better and how how do I have to go further and I think those moments you learn even now the most than when things are going great and fantastic and it's party time that's 
yeah, easy, the easy part, but the, the, definitely the things who's going yeah, deep down, yeah, bring something else up. So I, I think it's also, uh, yeah, it, it's not nice if you're in it, but afterwards you think, ah, yeah, I got some lessons out of this. this. And I think that brings you even for the next step further. Yeah, and during, we need those. Yeah, true, true. And during our interviews, we were also like looking for um, yeah, a sort of pattern. Is there a pattern to uh, get an injury, for example? So is there a reason to get it or is it just bad luck? Um, how do you see that, Sarah? Oh, it's a good question. I think it's both. <laughs> to give you an example, like with my ACL injury with my knee, I think it was a combination of overtraining and maybe a lack of general strength for me. Uh, but then I've had other injuries. I, for example, one of the other worst injuries that I've ever had is I got kicked in the face. So that's bad luck. <laughs> like mm. I don't think any amount of time in the gym would have prevented me from getting kicked in yeah, the or face. Or maybe you were tired. And I could have <laughs> been, but I, I like the situation was the defender mistook my head for the ball because I was doing a diving header. So, I mean, there's not a lot I could have done to prevent that situation from occurring apart from maybe not gone for the ball. So I think it, it, it can be anything and sometimes patterns for muscular injuries yeah for sure sometimes patterns can be drawn but other times like it can just be pure bad luck with, with any situation in life so you have to kind of have that resilience to be able to deal with both and and like mariana said try and um use those opportunities sometimes you need those opportunities to learn more about yourself and adapt in different ways yeah and then going back to uh, like the moment you went from new zealand to abroad for playing professional. Um, how was that step for you? It, it was good. It was a combination of like excitement and a bit of like nervousness and, and probably a bit of fear. I went from New Zealand to Germany. So similar to being here in the Netherlands, like New Zealand is the bottom of the Southern Hemisphere and here we are in the North of Europe. So it was a big physical change. It was a big cultural change. But growing up in New Zealand, I just knew that if I wanted to pursue football as a job, I couldn't stay in New Zealand. It just wasn't an option. So I was always in a way prepared to take that step because I knew it was necessary if I wanted to achieve that particular dream. But it, it doesn't stop you from being a bit nervous. And like I can remember being at the airport and being a bit teary saying goodbye to my friends and family. But as soon as I got on the plane and, and was, was sort of landing at Frankfurt airport, it's like, I did it. Like I realized my dream and, and now, you know, a different level of hard work has to start. Yeah, and that also reminds me of, of the stories also from you, Lev, going abroad uh, and then uh, arriving in a completely different culture, yeah. uh, different people, different hierarchy, um, yeah. all kind of, yeah, all yeah, that. Everything was different. Uh, you know, even... Um, Humor, habits, uh, jokes, everything was different. You know, when you meet people here and you just arrived. I remember my first flight from uh, from Moscow to Amsterdam and the uh, stewardess asked me, what would you like to drink? And she was start smiling and I was like, wow, was she, was she wants something from me. You know, I was sitting all the time like this and I, it was different to, to Russia and to Ukraine. So uh, it took me like... Um, maybe two years to change my habits, to change my attitude. Um, quite hard actually, but um, if you want to stay here in the Netherlands and you want to achieve something, you have to, you have to do it. Otherwise you can't, uh, you can't stay here, you can't play here. Yeah, and like the hierarchy, like um, you need to prove like your spot, right? You need yeah. to deserve it. You need to deserve it, especially with uh, some, f I mean, f with the foreigners, definitely. You have to be better than other players from, from Dutch division. And uh, that's completely different to, uh, for example, Ukraine, when I was born, when, where I was born. Because if you're a foreigner in Ukraine, you, you just, they, they just carry you on the f hands, you know. And here you have to prove that you are better than, uh, than uh, domestic players. Yeah, and Sarah, how was it for you, like um, being part of a female team? Um, I suppose it's different than men, like men just are very direct. 
women can be different, I suppose, with all emotions. And how, how was that dynamic? Yeah, it, it can be different, but also kind of similar to what Liv said, there is that element of you do have to go above and beyond to prove yourself. I think particularly in women's football as well, where, where there isn't a lot of money, so it's a huge investment to get a player um, from the other side of the world to come over and, and make a contribution to a, a club team in, in Germany or, or in the UK or, or Japan. So there is that element of like, I really have to, I've got to work the hardest. I've got to really prove myself every day at training and particularly in the games on the weekends to justify that type of investment. But then at the same time, I think women's football and, and sometimes women's sports, it's a small community. So people do really look out for each other. It's maybe a, a little bit less... Um, yeah, like you say, there, there can be a slightly different dynamic in that in that sense, but there's also that competitive side. So I've made some unbelievable friends uh, from the teams that I've I've played for and the countries that I visited, and there was a lot of like effort put into welcoming me because it benefits everyone if, if the person coming in is comfortable and is able to adapt quickly and to. I guess be as comfortable as they can be so that they can perform and then you know you're all working to that kind of collective goal. Yeah and talking about the, the women team Marianne you also uh, became a coach after your uh, your skating career and you trained women right? Yeah <laughs> I <think> sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it, it's a challenge for sure and the most difficult part I thought I think it was um, I, I uh, had um, on the highest level been an athlete myself, so then I thought, okay, if they could listen, uh, listening good to me, then they become also a very high level athlete. But that uh, kind of mindset does not work. <laughs> it is uh, you cannot make from a six a ten right away. So you have to think back. Okay, this one uh, has a level six, so we have to make it a seven. But it's quite interesting if you see you can become on the other side. It, uh, yeah, it learn a lot actually. Sometimes you don't know if you're at least yourself and you're in a team, what is around it and what kind of problems the others have. Because yeah, in, in individual sport, nobody really talks about that because everybody wants, wants to improve the best. But if you're a coach, yeah, then they come to you. And then, yeah, it, it really, um, yeah, give me an other way of thinking and mindset uh, about uh, yeah, the, the mindset actually. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah, I think it's also a really uh, interesting secret balance element to talk with you about uh, later on uh, today. And uh, Sarah, going back to you, like uh, the moment of retirement, how was that for you? Well, I mean, <coughs> I, I felt like I was very much prepared for it. Like I obviously had a, a great opportunity here at FIFA Pro. I'd spent a number of years actually preparing myself for that moment. And, and I was in a very fortunate position where I got to choose the moment that I retired. Not a lot of athletes have that luxury. So in every pro probably way possible, I was ready for it. But then going through it is something different again. It's um. It, it is a complete shift in like your attitude to so much that uh, has been really foundational in your life, whether that's training, being part of an, a high performing team environment, your identity as, as a person is really linked to what you do, uh, the way that other people relate to you when you are a football player in comparison to when you are, this is going to sound weird, but an ordinary citizen in a way uh, is, is really, really different. So. I was very fortunate to be able to choose my moment to walk into a, a career or a career opportunity that I really love that's still connected to the football industry. So my uh, experience is probably a lot different to other people's, but mentally, physically, there there are a lot of things that I don't think you can prepare yourself for and you just have to cope with them as best as you can. Yeah, how is it mentally and physically with you right now? I mean... Good. Apart from the <laughs> lockdown, I feel like mentally I've done okay. Uh, physically as well, uh, it's been good. I've I've tried to keep up some some good habits that I built over my career, and I think you you have a um, 
when you're an athlete, you have a certain type of relationship to fitness and physicality, and that does change when you choose to leave the sport, but there are certainly some things that you want to maintain in order for that uh, long-term health and longevity of, of your body. But mentally, yeah, it, it was quite challenging, I think, to be... Um, to be quite honest with you, it's it's probably still something that will take another few years to really get my head around. Uh, I Because of the coronavirus period, I actually haven't yet had to face like my New Zealand national team going away without me being there because the last time they were on tour was March of 2020 and I was there and I retired in that moment. So I think there's still some emotions mentally, things that I'll have to go through probably over the coming months and years, but I feel like I'm in a really good environment. I have a lot of support. Uh, the ability to talk to people is, is really critical and I'm still connected to the team. So I think in my heart that'll never change. Um, and I think that's actually healthy to hang on to that. Yeah, did you get any support in that? Um, I wouldn't, n not clinically, like there wasn't anything that I specifically set up for myself in terms of making sure that I checked in with a professional or anything like that. Uh, I actually had, I guess, I had not tried to retire, but I had retired actually in 2016 and then came out of retirement to rejoin the national team in the end of 2017 and 18 when they um, invited me to come back. So I also had a bit of a trial run. And back then, yeah, I actually made sure that I had certain touch points with certain people to make sure that that was being managed okay. I, I spoke to former players who had gone through retirement themselves. So I had a bit of a dry run in 2016 and 17. So this time around, I, I didn't feel that it was necessary to have those touch points. But I mean, I, I would actually really encourage athletes who are retiring to do that, to set that up so that you aren't triggered or surprised by the emotions and not prepared for them. I think that's a wonderful advice. Thank you, uh, Sarah, thank you very much. No worries, of course. <laughs> Yeah, so I was born with a congenital birth defect, fibular hemophilia. Um, uh, my legs didn't grow as a, as, a, as a baby. So the doctors told me I would never walk, never run, never play sports, and I was going to be in a wheelchair my whole life. Um, but with my family and friends and, and, and support and just people pushing me in my life and not taking no for an answer, it allowed me to live a, a full life from, from start to, to, the, to now. I've been able to play sports. You know, I, I run track and field now. I'm one of the fastest 400 meter runners in the world, legs or no legs. I am the fastest Paralympian in the world, running the breaking the Oscar Pistorius world record with a 44.38 second 400 meters. So my goal this year is to qualify for the Olympic Games and be the first uh, amputee American, disabled American to qualify for the Olympics. And for me to be able to do that, it'd be amazing to be on the world stage to show the world that regardless of your situation or regardless of where you, where you come from, if you have the right mindset and determination, you can achieve anything in your life. I was born without legs and I'm a professional runner. That's the complete opposite statistically what I should be doing, but that's the power of sport. That's the power of the mind. That's the power of willpower. That's the power of belief. You know what I mean? Having that belief system, even though people around me didn't think I, could, I should ever be able to walk or run, Every day that I wake up, I tell myself, hey, Blake, you're going to run. You're going to walk. You can do this. I never even thought the latter or to say, man, what would life would be like if I couldn't? I just made the, the decision each and every day. I'm going to go out there and do it. Yeah, not taking no for an answer and having the right mindset and having the right uh, determination. That's also the topic where we are going to talk about with our next champion. And I already introduced her a little. Uh, we are going to talk with Marianne Timmer. It's our Dutch former skating queen and who is three-time Olympic champion and two-time world record holder on the 1500 meters and the sprint. Long time ago. Long time ago, <laughs> Marianne. But you did it. It was like in um, in 1998, you won like two uh, golden medals, and eight years later, you did it again. It's quite unique, right? Uh, what was your secret in that? 
Well, if I tell the secret, it's not a secret anymore. <laughs> But so, now, now you can explain. <laughs> oh, now, now it's, now it's uh, <laughs> no problem to tell the secret. Yeah, I do think that uh, actually the, the movie we saw from the, the runner is also fantastic. He's looking in possibilities and I think that's the most uh, athletes uh, have that strongly uh, in themselves. And somehow, um, yeah, when I was younger, I felt, oh, I, I want to be uh, the same as Yvonne van Gennep. I saw her on TV and I was 14 or 15 years old and she won in Calgary in 88. And I really thought, I want to be her. I want that too. And deeply inside, yeah, there was something tickling that I really wanted to go to the Olympics. And actually, that is what happened. And what fascinated you about Yvonne? I think the environment of the Olympic, that it's really big and, and so much people and so much athletes and it's once in the four year. So that's really great and special. So actually, yeah, that's the place to be. And then you decided that in your head when you were young. Um, how, how was your journey from, from then? No, my journey was not really easy. I had a lot of humps uh, on my road as well. Uh, I've been overtrained in, in, in the time between 14 and 22. Uh, I became in a team that was actually training too hard for me, so I was two years overtrained. But I had results before that, so yeah, somehow you have a lot of doubts, like what I'm gonna do and, and am, I, uh, am I good enough for an athlete? So then I went out of that team, came in a sprint team. And sprint team is actually was, wasn't there. There was no sprint. There's um, the most people in, 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 well, 20 years back, it was all round. So I'm a mistaken all rounder. And that's why I went to sprint. So just by coincidence, actually. Yeah, and then we really uh, specifically uh, trained on sprint. And yeah, and that, that year was really, uh, going to be a success and the year after was the Olympic and I was not really the favorite but at that moment I came on the Olympic and I felt like 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 um, butterflies in my stomach when I went in the bus to the ice rink and I somehow I started to fly around how is that possible I wanted so bad and I believed in it and I wanted it and not not that I thought I could win <coughs> but it's just to take the best out of myself, the perfect race, that's what I had in my mind, because that's where I had influence on. Yeah, do you think you can create it, or is it something, um, it's in your DNA and you, you can train that? Well, I do think most athletes, when I became a trainer, then I saw the difference in mind thinking between some people. Um, some people are going to crack on the moment when they had to uh, perform, so it's scary, it's, you don't know what people's gonna say, uh, other people's gonna watch, uh, what's gonna happen with me, it's, it's kind of scary because you have to do something what another maybe is not gonna do. And I do think for me, I was um, strong enough or maybe somehow I wanted to go there and it, it felt like a tunnel that's getting smaller and smaller. So even little things in the team that some people are gonna crack and it's really negative, I thought, okay, you go to the physio and then I tried not to get into my zone. I look afterwards. At that moment, I was not really thinking about it, but it's going by themselves. Yeah, you mean like if they're, they have like negative energy? Yeah, the influence. You don't want to, to get no, badly? No, it does not help. And especially not one or two weeks before you have to perform on the Olympics. So yeah, somehow uh, I got in a really small tunnel. And then, yeah, th I did it a few times in my career. So somehow you can create it for yourself. Yeah, I do believe that. Lef, how do you It's, uh, listen to this? This is the beautiful, uh, I think uh, how she talk about this. I think the most of the top athletes um, feel like this because nothing can uh, bother you from from the both sides so you just walk to this uh, goal and and nothing can move you from this road actually this is the perfect uh, way to expl uh, explain it so um, i remember from my stay in uh, in ukraine in in sport internat i was there with all these uh, young 
players who uh, were doing crazy things and I thought okay I want to become the top football player and that's the only goal I saw for myself and I think this is the most important this is the big difference with another yeah with another players and I think the difference between being a skating champion like which in the sprint uh, especially it's like uh, um, yeah really fast but a football competition it's like 90 minutes um, or a little bit longer but how do you stay in that tunnel and you hear uh, when there's no COVID you hear all the fans uh, screaming and and how do you stay in that that focus and that tunnel like Mariana I think talked. mentally you have to um, exp emotionally you have to be prepared for that um, and I think it's uh, most important that you can visualize some 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 games for example before the game I was thinking about okay what can happen what should I expect from it and uh, knowledge knowledge is of course very important if you um, tactically very good prepared for it and uh, mo emotionally very strong mentally strong you can you can achieve a lot um, and I saw it was a very big players for example with Luis Suarez I saw that he didn't care about anything he just make his action on the field and then he doesn't care about anyone and not about the audience not about uh, anyone actually even uh, his own players he didn't care about he just saw the goal and that I've learned from him for example and also from Andrei Shevchenko one of the big stars from Ukraine uh, such as things you, you learn from them because they have it like naturally in them they don't care about in good way n not not about anything yeah, do you think you can learn that or is there like a, a limit on, on I don't that? know it's it's hard to say because I think you can learn to a certain level um, you can get some um, yes yeah, some knowledge about it you can yeah I think you can learn it not, not everything because some people can they I don't think they're born with it but they in use they they get it for example maybe from some I don't know, uh, environment, but you can learn it definitely, especially with some professionals. And Sarah, how do you, uh, how do you think about that? Do you agree? I do. I think the ability to narrow your focus is such a, an important skill in sport. I mean, I don't have any experience in skating, obviously, but like Lev was saying, there can be so many variables around you, the crowd, the referee, the opposition, um, the weather, for example, and you just have to focus on what you can control. And that's actually a very small amount of things in the grand scheme. So I think the best players and the best athletes are the ones that can just cross that white line and they're just on and they're able to perform no matter what's going on around them. It's an extraordinary skill. And I think, yes, you can learn it. And I think the good thing about football is maybe you don't have that 100%, but some of your teammates do and, and they're able to carry you in those moments. But for, for an individual athlete, that would be an extraordinary skill to be able to do that and to focus not so much on winning. I think what stuck out to me is you said that you wanted to race the perfect race, which is like, if you do that, then you have personal satisfaction no matter the outcome. So I think it's it's really actually inspiring and I can certainly relate to and feel um, a, a sense of, of alignment with, with them and, and what they say about the ability to do that because it's it's absolutely important. Yeah, and that extraordinary uh, element and trick. Yeah, Marianne, you already told that, that you have it like, or you had it like twice in your career. Uh, yeah, I had a few a times. Few times. I also can remember that was also a very important competition. I sat on the bench, put my skates on, and there is one other skater, it's a big competitor from another country, and she sits next to me, like almost on my lap, and the whole couch is empty. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I look around me and thought, okay, but at that moment, it's just a mind game. She tries to influence me on my mind to, uh, but I love those games because I think she's putting energy in me. So I thought, oh, thank you, thank you, because she's not focused on her race. And those things are very nice also when I was coach to give that advice to my, uh, my, my girls. Yeah, did you do that as well? Those sneaky tricks? <laughs> nah, not really to, um, because that actually says that the other one is insecure 
but of course the game like I always make sure I put a little uh, well my hair is nice uh, some little makeup that I look like awesome and that the others look at me and I think wow she's really looking strong but even if I was insecure too I'm not going to show that so those things yes of course yeah and then the moment uh, in Nagano you did it twice how was that feeling well, the first time on the 1500 meter, I had once bronze on the 1500 meter on a world championship. And then I was a little scared for the 1500 because I'm a sprinter and the 1500 meter is really gonna hurt, really hurt. And, uh, and then two days after is the 1000 meters. So that was my speciali speciality. So I was thinking by myself, hmm, maybe it's better to skate 80% because then I'm not gonna throw all my energy in the 1500 and the most chance I have is the thousands. So I went to the trainer and I thought, maybe it's good to ask. Well, that was not so good idea. <laughs> why? He, why? <laughs> he said, well, um, keep, it keep it nicely. He said, what do you think? He said other words, but I'm not gonna say it here. And uh, he said, you are training over four years to go to the Olympics. And if you're here, you go for the 100%. So are you nuts? I said, well, sorry for asking, but it's good to, to, to talk with other people if, if your mind sometimes goes a little off. But and of course, course I knew the answer. Of course <laughs> I knew the answer. Why did you ask then? Just to make sure. Why? Uh, it's just uh, the reflection, I think I needed it or something. That's or was it a confirmation you needed to hear? Oh, maybe, something? yeah. So it was a dumb question, actually. <laughs> but, but then I thought, <laughs> okay. I'm going to focus on my technique. The only thing that counts is technique. And somehow I came at that, um, that uh, performance totally uh, in a rhythm and a flow. And I heard and saw nobody. I really thought every, every stroke I made, I felt it every single meter, I centimeter, everything. And I think that's, that's where every athlete is looking for it, to get in that moment. Yeah, and how did you create that? Well, get in the tunnel. Actually. <laughs> in the tunnel. <laughs> the tunnel. <laughs> yeah, it is a boring. <laughs> no, it's a boring life. It's not really special. If you're an athlete and you need to perform, you you have to focus. You lay on your bed. You, you all the energy you can uh, use or or you need that. Yeah, you have to. It's very boring, but it's just all for the goal, and it's worth it. If I had to do it over again, I would do it again. Yeah, and then the moment you became two times Olympic champion and uh, you went from Nagano back to Sapamir in the Netherlands and then the moment, and I want you to, to ask to read aloud your piece of uh, text in your chapter in the book and then i uh, love to talk with here. you uh, about it after that. I found, found all those people a little unsettling, to be honest. They wanted to touch me and they wanted to hold me. And I thought, what is happening? People will burst into tears because they were so fanatical. fanatical. Of course, it's a huge compliment, but it's also overwhelming and intense. And I had a lots of new friends all of a sudden. After traveling back for 24 hours, I arrived in Sopomir, where the streets were filled with people. There was a traffic jam with people who wanted to visit our street while normally about two cars a day would pass through each day. It was fun in the beginning, but after a while I thought, life goes on, please, can we get back to normal? I couldn't walk down the street freely anymore. The Olympic had caused quite a stir and I got a little fed up with, uh, with it after a while. Yeah, my life totally changed after Nagano and it's actually Kind of weird. Yeah, how, you, how do you deal with that? Because yeah, you go through it. It's how? just <laughs> yeah, how. There's people are gonna call. They they ask me to open up a store or getting on television or they. Well, they, I had a lot of friends and all of a sudden that with people I never saw before. So that's that's strange and sometimes it's fun because you come in situations where you've never been. But it, it was actually scary too. People want to touch you and you're not ready for it. And you, you, you come in a lot of households because of the TV. So people feel like, oh, we know each other. 
So, but I can't see them if I am on TV. So it's, that's the difference. People feel like, yeah, we know, we know you. And I think that's a big gap between for me and for them. And that people is going to um, yeah, cry and, and they are emotional about it. That's actually a compliment, but it's also strange, of course, for me. And I think, well, it's not really normal. Uh, that's what I thought then. Yeah, true. But Lev, how do you uh, hear this? Because does it sound familiar no, to you? I think it's beautiful how she described it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, I think um, yeah, every... Of course, I didn't win uh, Nagano, and um, and I think it's a big difference between um, individual sport and team sport, as I as we mentioned. But um, in team sport, of course, you can achieve all together, and uh, this is also beautiful. Also beautiful, you can share things with uh, with your team and enjoy all together. I'm more team player, and I like it very much because um, this feeling when you can do something with uh, with 11 players 22 players whatever then that's that's amazing as well yeah and Mariana going back to you because after all the Hosanna period there was also like a, a this disaster period like you say uh, in the book and, and during the interview um, can you tell a little bit more about that uh, well after the Olympic there was also a change in the in a bond with the skating union um, one, one skater was already stepped out of the bond and st started an own commercial team. So I thought by myself, hmm, that's my, probably a good idea for me too. So then I create our own team with own people, with our own coach, and I do my own way. And I think for me then it was, after all, a little bit too early. Not thought about it good enough, trusted people. I was naive, so that ended in 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 court. Actually, the the sponsor didn't come. We started already with training, and yeah, some people uh, I, I pulled the plug because well, a lot of things weren't weren't right. And then I got in court, and I thought, yeah, I've never been there. It was like in a movie. And then I had a lot of success in Nagano, so. It was in the newspaper, so I was very embar embarrassed to go out of the street, and I thought, "Oh, those people! What do they have think? Uh, what they think about me?" So actually, I didn't feel, yeah, comfortable to to go out a lot. So I started painting at home and try to get my mind uh, away f from all those thoughts. And in between, the Olympics uh, keep going in Salt Lake City. And they didn't wait for me when I was feeling better. So I did uh, uh, skate at the Olympics there, but I was not in a good shape. Uh, I was too big, too much stress. I had all things on my skin. And um, yeah, I was, uh, I was not another success story. But yeah, after the Olympics, I was thinking, yeah, what am I going to do? When I came home then, it was nobody actually. All my friends were gone. No friends from Nagano. It was like maybe one or two persons and that's it. So the contrast was, was a lot. And then I was thinking, yeah, what I'm going to do now? Because if I'm going to quit now, then I'm done with all the stories and people telling stories on TV and they try to push me to, to pay a lot of money and stuff like that. Or because I got fourth in Salt Lake City, I was thinking, if I didn't have all those stuff, I, I, was, I had more energy and probably I was more, much more successful. So, I made up the balance and I thought, okay, we go the right way. I'm going to keep going for the next four years. I became in a group with uh, Jak Ori, where I stayed uh, for another eight years. And then some, uh, yeah, the, the problems got resolved and I felt better. And then the success... Uh, yeah, came back, and that was a really nice feeling. Yeah, and I think um, that's also a really nice closure of your story today, because, um, of course, you want to know more about your story, and we can read it in the book. So, uh, Marianne, for now, thank you very much.
it was it was a nasty accident i mean i was uh, i was i broke a lot of bones um but at the same time i was i was just so lucky as well that i i didn't hit my head because at that at that speed going into a wall i mean it could have could have ended up being a lot worse also so i'm i'm extremely lucky that the things i did break are injuries i could i could all recover from um Whereas, yeah, you, you see some injuries that are obviously a lot more serious when when it involves um, involves the head or the spine. So, um, I, was, I was lucky not to have done uh, more serious serious damage. But it's yeah, nonetheless, I mean, it's uh, I'm still in the process, still trying to get back to my best uh, from that crash. Um, um, yeah, a year and a half later, and I'm I'm still working on uh, muscle weaknesses and imbalances and. Um, trying to get my right, right leg back up to the same strength that it was before. Um, but it's, yeah, I'm, I'm just extremely grateful that I'm, I'm back on the bike. I'm back racing again. Uh, I mean, that, that already is a, is a huge accomplishment for me. And if, if I am able to get back to the Tour de France and, um, even, even with a chance of winning it, I mean, of course, I've, I'm sitting with four four titles now. Um, the record is five, so I mean that's a it's a huge huge motivation for me to try and try and get number five. Uh, like our cy cycling legend uh, Chris Froome just told, he was lucky enough he didn't injure his head, but we do have a champion in our book who did badly injure his head. And you might know him probably um, as one of the greatest goalkeepers in uh, European history. Um, and he's the most capped player of the Czech national team with 124 caps. And you might also know him as the famous goalkeeper with the helmet. And currently he's the technical and performance advisor of Chelsea. And we are really honored he's with us today through Zoom. Peter Czech, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, Hello, I do see you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Peter. And although you faced many injuries during your career, um, yeah, it was also very consistent of 20 years. What is your secret to be so consistent during those 20 years? I have to say that uh, to be consistent, you need to be consistent in what you do. So, which means that you have to be training every day to, with a purpose and with a purpose to get better. And uh, I think, you know, I've done, I've done that uh, throughout my years that uh, no matter what was my mood, if I felt tired or energetic or if we were winning or we were losing, my process of uh, coming to training was always the same. You know, I, I try to use every minute of my training to get better and improve and, and work on things and and I try to be as um, as best uh, version of myself as possible. And and when you do that consistently, day after day, week after week, month after month, then you know, then uh, the years come by, and and you are able to to sustain that. And and I think that's that's probably the key because you need to train to win with the purpose. It's, uh, once you just go train to train, and and you spend time, then I don't believe that uh, it gives you that edge and and the possibility to to compete with um, with others for such a long time. Yeah, and like uh, Chris Froome just told uh, uh, as well, like uh, not having a head injury, you did uh, have like a head injury um, yourself. Um, can you tell us about the cause of that injury? Well, you know, we play the, we play the game and as uh, many times in the game you dive uh, for the ball, uh, player try to reach it, you dive, you take you take it uh, from their feet and when unfortunately you know the we we collided, the player landed on, on my uh, on my head and and um, you know the, my head was slightly off of the ground and then as he landed I get the double impact from you know getting hit from the from the knee and from the weight of the player and from the ground and Unfortunately, my uh, my skull broke, and um, and you know it was after what many maybe 15 seconds in the game, first action, and 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 the game was over for me. Which obviously you know you think game's over, but you, you don't know uh, how uh, how severe the injury was at the time. I think the the person who directly recognized it was the doctor Brian English, who who ran on and he uh, straight away knew that um, the thing looks much more serious than 
than everybody thought. And and then um, I was lucky enough to be transported to the hospital uh, quick enough to uh, to be able to uh, to come back. And and of course, you know, when you when you have such a injury, you never know if you come back. It, you never know how long it takes. You never know if uh, if your uh, if your brain uh, will reach some kind of a limit where it will just sh- you know show the uh, the end and um, so I have to say with the with the great uh, intervention of the doctor and and everything went well for me in the surgery and and then when I started my road to to recovery it was um, it was a long journey I prepared myself for a for a much longer journey but uh, I had some previous experiences with injuries so I. I followed my path of uh, doing everything I could to to make sure I give myself a chance to fully recover, and and I, I was lucky that my body responded well as well, and and I managed to come back uh, in a, in a really short time, comparing to what was uh, previously uh, predicted. So you know, and, I, and I'm I'm glad that uh, the most of the or, or even more most of the time of my career actually I spent after the injury only only with the difference that uh, I had to wear the helmet. And how did the idea of wearing a helmet arise? Well, I had only two options. I had to I had to minimize the risk because um, of course the risk of uh, getting concussions and and con- you know if you get more concussions you know how fatal it can be. Obviously there was a risk that my um, uh, the, the skull could break again, not in the same place because I have metal plates in, in my head, but around, and nobody could guarantee that. So obviously, the, the surgeon said, "Okay, you might you might try to come back, but you will need to make sure that uh, you protect uh, the head more." And and already during the during the recovery process, I I started training with the uh, with the helmet. To make sure that I don't get hit, that I don't split the skull, and anything happens. So I got used to it, and and then in the end of the day, uh, you know, when you are told that you have option to play with the helmet or, or not at all, I think it's an easy choice. And as a kid, I used to play uh, ice hockey with the helmet, so you know, I was not I was not really worried about it, and and I've never been worried how it looks because you know that was not my concern. My concern was that I wanted to play and I wanted to be back on the pitch. Yeah, I think you also like um, created a sort of trick, right? Because I remember you were telling about uh, your, uh, yeah, your youth uh, that you also broke your leg, and actually from then on you became an expert in dealing with injuries, right? Can you tell us your trick, what you thought there, and what you implement on your career throughout your 20 years uh, career? You know, I realized that when you know when you are ten year old, you are enthusiastic, and and then you don't follow all the rules, and and you try to test how what you can do. So when I had the tibia peroneal fracture in my leg, and I had to have the uh, the plaster for for four months, I I realized that I could do so many things regardless if I had the plaster or if I had the crutches, and and I was testing every day how much I can do without without sort of feeling the pain and without kind of putting the the leg at risk and you know I was learning how to walk on crutches play football with my friends on crutches then I realized that there are so many things I, I could do I could catch the ball or sitting lying on the side even making some uh, some work uh, running on the crutches without support of my legs and I started doing all these things and then I realized that there are tons of uh, exercises and things you can do even if you have a broken leg and you have the plaster and and it's not something which should stop you doing things and you know i had a lot of fun and i kept training and i kept doing all these uh, all these things in the training where i was sitting or lying on the floor catching the ball and, and then supported uh, you know playing to touch with them um, with my with my teammates with my right foot and and then even with the plaster you know you just you just do everything and and I think that was a great discovery for me that uh, that you should never feel limited by a, by an injury. Of course, you cannot you cannot uh, step outside of the uh, of the guidance of the doctor because then you can make things worse and or or actually you can end your career by not being clever with it. But um, but when I had my head injury and when I had other injuries in my in my career, actually that was that was something I always used. I never cared about what I can do. I always cared about all the things I could do to make me feel as fit as possible, as close to 
training I felt I need to do in order to uh, to to maintain my my performance and and my skills and my and physical state. And uh, that was one of the things which um, I believe always helped me to cut any sort of prediction of my injuries to almost a half, pretty much with every injury I had. Because, um, you know, with the guidance of the doctor, you don't do that. I didn't really mind that. I just said, okay, can I do this, all this, all this, all this, all this? And in the end, in the end of the day, you, you end up doing pretty normal uh, routine of things you can do and and your fitness state and and your training session is still valuable enough that when you are told that you can start doing more you actually are in a good condition to to do so and i believe it accelerates even the you know the process of healing because the body sort of feels well you know we are fine we're going we're doing well so it always worked with me yeah true better thank you so much like focusing on on what you can do instead of what you can do i think it's a really good advice so thank you very much for joining us and uh, wish you all the luck at chelsea and uh, talk to you soon thank you take care everyone <laughs> thank you yeah, and I think that's also really uh, good to know for you at home. Like in the book, at the end of the book, we have different uh, yeah, tips and tricks from all our champions. And that's definitely inspiring to read. Well, I was very lucky enough to start a new life in, in, when I came to the UK. Um, not speaking a word English so for me that was always challenging uh, but you know growing up in Africa I think it taught me mentally to be strong and um, a lot of people do ask me a lot of questions will go through your mind how come you can achieve a lot and continue and as I said like mentally you just got to have that and, I, and if, if I think back and take each step back and start from when I was a kid for me life wasn't as simple as what it is now you know um to have four Olympic medals, to, ha to have the world, to recognize you as you, what you achieve. It was never like that. Yeah, like Mo Farah just told, growing up in Africa told him to be strong. And that's also where we are going to talk about with our next champion. And that is um, Evgeny Levchenko. And people talk or uh, call you also Lev, so it's, Okay, with you, I will introduce you uh, as Lev. And um, yeah, you're a former professional football player. And um, yeah, the thing you're most proud of, you told me, is about playing in the, for the Ukraine national team. Yeah. Um, you became uh, like, or you are naturalized as a Dutch citizen in 2001. But like we said, you grew up in Ukraine. We already talked about a little bit about your youth already, but can you tell a little sure. bit more about your youth? And yeah, sure. Um, I was born in Ukraine. Actually, I was in the Soviet Union. Um, 1978, it was actually the, um, yeah, the, the communism time in, in, in Ukraine. We were a big part of uh, um, Soviet um, Soviet Union actually and everybody was equal on the paper so um, that was quite funny actually because uh, everybody should earn the same money amount of money and um, my father was just a worker on the, on the factory and every Sunday or Saturday he was playing football so he took me from age of three I think uh, to the football field so I don't have any I didn't have any chance to, to become something else only football player my mother was scared about it, but uh, my father was, yeah, because she said the football is not for uh, making a living. So she said, you have to become a musician. So he gave me like a uh, accordion to play music and I hated it really. So I went uh, every Sunday with my father and um, from the age of six, um, I started to play football with a uh, within team. Um, yeah, I was quite stubborn and persistent. So every every time after the training, I stay on the pitch and trying to do some tricks and uh, and and just to become like an eternal. I remember, I remember that time I was just training in the snow. It was minus ten or something, minus twenty, and I was so cold. But I didn't want to go home because I didn't score enough goals, for example. 
that was fi funny time. When I was 14, I signed the first contract. Quite crazy uh, story because the president of the club, he was the actually a mafia boss. He said, "Okay, I give you hundred dollars, and uh, hundred dollars for uh, for Ukraine was a lot of money." So. I was like very happy, but from another part, I earned more money than my parents, and that was the first first contract for me. Um, I was quite happy about that, so I thought, what should I do with that money? I didn't I didn't use any money actually because I um, I was living at home, and um, I thought I'm gonna buy a car for my grandfather. <laughs> But he didn't have any driver license. Um, well, yeah, that was funny, actually. So, well, what did you do? Uh, I gave the money to my to my parents, and they uh, they use it. They they bought uh, clothes and everything. So, but actually, there was a shift in um, between my uh, myself and my father because um, he was um, he didn't earn any money, and I was earning like hundred dollars a month, quite a lot actually for Ukraine, and. Um, for me, it was a, like a mental game. Um, I was I become quite a big man actually in in, in the family, and uh, my father was um, yeah he has trouble with it. He start drinking. Yeah, so for me it was really hard. When I was seventeen, I went to Moscow, um, and um, I played for CSKA Moscow uh, one year, and after that. I went to the Netherlands. So my, if I summarize my time in Ukraine, it was really hard because there was a, not enough space for kids being a kid. But it was quite good for me to become really strong, especially mentally. And um, uh, like this guy runner said, um, in Africa, you have to be mentally really prepared. But in Ukraine, you have to be also really prepared for the bad things. And I learned a lot of things in Ukraine that I use now. Yeah, like what? Like how to react, how to communicate with people, how to, uh, um, how to be persistent, how to be stubborn, still stubborn, if you want to achieve something. So that's what I like and what I do. Yeah, and I think also, um, like an example you told during the interview, it was like the moment of your first football shoes and also like, uh, maybe it's it's nice to tell also about yeah. the, the football you you used, right? There are two things I want to tell about uh, my f first football and my first football shoes. There are <laughs> two short stories. Uh, my first football, my father gave gave it to me when I was maybe ten. Uh, he just spent his whole salary, like about twenty twenty five dollars, on on football, and that's meant a lot for me. Because I remember the smell of this ball. I remember the, I slept with that ball. And I remember because it's really important for me and for my um, relationship with my father. Um, secondly, of course, I got this uh, old, old shoes. Like they, you couldn't wear them. They were like really hard. You couldn't put a sh sh uh, foot in it. And I had the blisters, blood. My uh, feet became like a cramped and uh, but I wanted to become a football player so I wear these shoes and uh, yeah it's actually stupid but as a child you do such a things and the third thing is uh, I had a whole wall with the posters also with Marco van Basten because I remember this big poster on my wall with Marco van Basten, Ruth Gullit and uh, um, Frank Reichardt uh, they were playing for Milan and it was such a beautiful for me like every night I went to bed and I saw those posters and I thought, okay, I'm going to become a star like, a star like them. <laughs> we are definitely going to ask that to Marco later on, <laughs> how, how he like, reacts on, on your story <laughs> right now. And going back to um, yeah, that moment, your youth, to the Netherlands, like you already talked a little bit about that yeah. sort of culture shock. Yeah, it was quite, quite a culture shock because when you're... Um, from Ukraine to come to the Netherlands, it's a big difference. Difference in everything. As I thought, it's difference in habits, humor, mentality, in um, the way how you approach people and way how you communicate. Even the way how you laugh with the people, it's different. The way how you look at the people. And for me, it was like about two years. Uh, was it 
two years how, when I changed my habits, when I changed, when I smiled to people, because in the in, in beginning I was scared of people actually, not scared, but I was they, just uh, holding the diff, um, distance. But is that something cultural? It's a cultural, or? cultural thing. And uh, of course, now, in- nowadays, uh, youth is more open because they see, in, they have internet, they communicate with the people, they speak some English. But in my days, 1996, it was quite difficult. And uh, yeah, that was a mentally very difficult for me to, uh, to settle here. And it took me like two years to, uh, uh, to change it. Yeah, and what did you do to, to, yeah, to do that? The, the biggest steps, biggest step I took, it was step inside of me. I thought, okay, I should go, especially outside, should speak to, to people outside, even with, uh, with mistakes, uh, try to learn Dutch with mistakes and uh, just do something. Otherwise, if you sit home, I was sitting in hotel and do, doing nothing was no option. So uh, I remember my first time when I went to Obertain to supermarket and it was crazy. I went inside and I saw so many different uh, kind of yogurt, for example, like 20 different kind of yogurt. And in Ukraine, we have only one kind of yogurt. It calls yogurt as well. So that, <laughs> that was such funny things. But commun- communicate and trying to do, uh, to, yeah, speak to people, it was uh, most important for me. And I think, uh, Sarah, talking about like the difference in, in language, for example, I think for you, an advantage was that you're from New Zealand, where you speak English, right? Um, is that a, a pro, you think? Or did you learn other languages uh, throughout your career? Or Certainly, it's an advantage, because I think most places around the world, they're taught English in school from a young age. So there is a bit of um, a luxury if you're a native English speaker. But it actually didn't help that much in a footballing context. When I went to Germany, I had no choice but to learn the language. And like Lev said, it actually encourages you to be a bit more vulnerable, which other p- people appreciate because you're trying to relate to them on um, like familiar territory for them. So I learned German. I was there for two years. And then I spent two and a half years in Japan. And that was a whole nother culture shock. And there I really had no choice. I had to learn first, I guess, football Japanese to communicate with my teammates and, and with the coaches and things like that. And, and the Japanese people are very shy, they're very reserved. So even though they had, most people had a basic understanding of English, they were terrified to speak it. So it actually really helped a lot for me to be terrible at Japanese in the beginning and encourage them to speak a little bit of English back and created, I think, a little bit of rapport, which otherwise would not have um, been possible. So yeah, you have to step outside of your comfort zone a lot. So learning those two languages really helped with general integration, not only into the team, but yeah, I remember the first time I went to a Japanese supermarket and I le- it took me probably an hour and a half to buy 10 items, but I felt amazing afterwards <laughs> because I did it and I didn't have to ask anyone for help. I didn't want to use my phone for Google Translate. So it also helps with like your... Um, Integrate. Yeah, integration <laughs> and your, your sense of starting to feel a little bit more comfortable and hopefully eventually feeling a little bit more at home. So it's funny, the small moments that really stick out. Uh, but you do have to be brave. It, it can be really difficult. Yeah, and talking about that cultural differences, it reminds me also of our interview, Mariana, where you told about the, the American coach you, uh, you had. Uh, like, um, yeah, the mentality, uh, really direct. Yeah, maybe you can tell it better. Yeah, it's more like, uh, yes, we do this. It's going better from here and it's great. It's awesome. But I'm from the north of, of Holland and it's like, okay, first see, then believe. So it's a totally different kind of view. So somehow, uh, sometimes we had a confrontation. Yeah, how, how do you deal with that? Just this ear in, the other ear out. <laughs> Yeah, and just leave, yeah, not every discussion is worth to make a discussion out of, over it. But so, do you think uh, you will become a better athlete when you have like the bravoure and, and like an American It depends on, the, on some people, like um, some, I think Erben, he loved it. He's like... Yeah, Erben is the, your Dutch teammate, also He a was my teammate, champion. but he is like flying about the, those words. <laughs> he likes that, but but for me it doesn't work. So I think it's really individual. 
Yeah, and Lev, how is it for you? Like the differences between uh, cultures, but also like egos in the team, for example. Were you sensitive for that or? I'm more reserved. I think I'm more net <coughs> like you. I think we, um, I want to see first and then achieve um, because, um, yeah, it's it's also, I played in Groningen, for example, in the same. Um, yeah, you were in Groningen. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know the mentality as well. So, um, it. It, it seems yeah, maybe like to explain to the people at yeah. home, uh, Marianne is from Groningen. It's a, it's a city in the Netherlands, <laughs> and uh, Levchenko uh, he's also uh, like the, the yeah how do you say it like the the, the, the hero in <laughs> Gr in yeah. Groningen. Yeah. Um, so they know both about the, the Groningen mentality. But left. I like it very continue. much. <laughs> I like I like Groningen mentality because uh, they are reserved. They they want to first show and then and then just talk about it, not other way around, yeah. Yeah, and to tell you a secret, I'm also from Groningen, so... Uh, <laughs> nothing <laughs> above Groningen, it's complete. It's a slogan. <laughs> yeah, There's nothing true. above Groningen. Yeah. <laughs> true, but from there. Yeah, from from, uh, if, if you compare it, of course, with, uh, with a team sport, you have different egos, you have different persons, uh, different um, characters. But I think it's uh, important for the coach, for example, and for uh, people who work in the club to organize them to one what something that can achieve something can work out so i think it's really really important and uh, i think the big uh, big coaches and uh, uh, big managers can can do it yeah and talking about physical health in the book um i also remember you were telling about um yeah like training um for example, you played uh, at Vitesse and there was like strength training not allowed, right? Strength training? Like a power, like lifting oh, and, yeah, and that's, stuff like that. Oh uh, yeah, there was a time that uh, no one wanted to do it and the coach said it's like, it's not forbidden, but did not, not one did it. No one went to the gym, so it was crazy time actually, because now I cannot, cannot imagine football, uh, football trainings without, uh, without going to the gym. So, yeah, I think it was a different time, different approaches. Yeah. Yeah, and like um, the moment of retirement, um, can you maybe uh, take like your piece of paper and your part in the book? Yeah, okay. Um, we know, we, everybody knows about black hole, but I, <laughs> I call it gray hole. So. Before I quit, I thought about finishing my career and I was looking forward to relaxing and not doing anything. But the structure you lose when you finish your sportive, sporting career is actually essential and it's difficult to hold yourself together without it. You literally feel like you're losing everything and you don't want to do anything. I felt bad about not being a football player anymore. The things I, I miss most from my football career are the feeling of being on the pitch, the feeling of creating excitement for the competition, working towards a goal, the recognition of the audience, being a part of the team and setting new goals. Fortunately, I wasn't scared about no longer being recognized in public. I know other football players who struggle with that. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Can you like yeah. explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course. When you when you, I was uh, 36 when I finished my football career and I was prepared for it. I um, I went to um, some courses. I I did some studies, so I was prepared for it. But still, you know, the moment when you finish your football career, you feel it. You feel like okay, what should I do now? You can sleep till whatever you want, you can do whatever you want, but the structure that, uh, that you, you miss so much, and um, it's in my opinion, of course, but I, I was like three or four months just completely lost. I slept till 11 o'clock in the morning, didn't do anything, didn't do any um, training, so yeah, it was actually not the best time. But then I, um, I went to the gym again, start running, do some exercises, and um, and found more, um, yeah, more 
light in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you experience it like I that? Felt, I felt like I found a goal and again, and that's, that's the most important, that you can find something what uh, takes you from the bed again. And um, yeah, that's, that's how I felt. Yeah, and what made it to, to make that switch? Like it's it, now it's enough, and now I want to. I didn't feel quite well after after finished my career because I didn't know what to do, and this is the most uh, horrible thing actually. And that's happened to a lot of football players, as I know. They start drinking and start doing crazy things, spend all, a lot of money to actually to compensate um, their time and their love to the audience, for example. But. Uh, you can't gain it anymore because um, people just forget you within a couple of months, a couple of years, if you're a big player maybe. But um, I think it's most important to find a goal for yourself. This is the... Uh, and for me, it was just a mental game again. I started to... Uh, yeah, to, f to set uh, just small goals and to go to them. Yeah, you say like, I know other footballers who experience that, but how is that for you? Like, do you also like uh, looking for, yeah, for some adrenaline to, to get that of course, experience again? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, yes. Yeah, of course. It's, um, I think um, I started with, <laughs> with racing, <laughs> racing the car, racing the motorbike, uh, playing some different sports, uh, jumping with parachutes. So I tried everything, but uh, I think at the end uh, you become more uh, relaxed when you find some goal for yourself and just you know i become a father so that's changed you a lot as well but the most important of course it's um that i found for myself what i should what i do and i'm doing now players union so i'm really happy with that <laughs> to help also the players football players who who come to the netherlands for example or who play here yeah what kind of advice would you give them uh to the foreigners, of course, I would say uh, learn the language as soon as possible. Uh, try to understand the uh, jokes and humor, of course, and um, yeah, just integrate as soon as possible. Yeah, and like um, talking about, uh, yeah, also, um, yeah, right now working at the, the Players' Union here in the Netherlands, uh, I also remember your first office day. It's also, uh, that was also like quite challenging, right? I want to run away, yes. <laughs> yeah, it was quite challenging because uh, I never sit before in the office. So I came into the office and I was thinking, okay, what should I do here? I only do things with my feet and now I have to do it with my, <laughs> with, with my hands and, uh, and to coordinate things. But um, yeah, I learned quite fast and um, especially with, uh, with the right people around me. It was good, good to learn. Yeah, and how is it now? Easy, actually quite easy. We have a lot of uh, things to do. And uh, I have a lot of communication with, uh, with uh, football players, especially with uh, captains of the teams. Um, and I like it very much because I'm still in football. That's, that's, that's my goal. Wow, Lev, Mariana, Sarah, I want to thank you all for uh, your inspiring stories. And for you at home, you can read them or their stories in more detail in the book, The Secret Balance of Champions, Health Challenges in Elite Sport. I think what matters most for the athletes is to have balance of daily life. I mean, it's awesome to, to be a champion, it's awesome to work hard and it's the way you have to do it. Uh, there is no shortcuts, so work on yourself, but at the same time know that there is a world outside completely independent from your sport. There is family, there are friends, there are people who love you and who can bring uh, that um, balance into your life, which uh, will make you even a better athlete and, and even a better person. And I think that's the most important thing to realize. It took me some time, <laughs> but since I realized that I, I am, think I am a better shooter now. Yeah, having balance in daily life is something our next champion know everything about as well. And um, he's a Dutch former sailor in the RSX class. 
two-time Olympic champion and two-time world champion. And he's with us today through Zoom as well, just like a Petr Cech. And we do have a live connection with this champion uh, in LA. So it's about like uh, 7.30 in the morning. Uh, Dorian van Rijsselbergen, are you there? Yes, of course I'm here. Good morning and yeah, good, good afternoon over there. Yes, amazing that you're with us today uh, so early, Dorian. Um, yeah, the interview I had with you uh, in our book, I do remember it's, yeah, for me, it, it was very touching and you, you talked about your impressive career, but also about your struggles just before you retired. But to start with your amazing career that you, you became Olympic champion twice in a row, what was your secret balance in that? Um, I think my secret balance was to know uh, how to have the right amount of fun and to keep, uh, yeah, to keep the fun included in the program and not seeing fun and, uh, as a distraction, but as a tool. Yeah, and, and how did you do that then? Well, for example, we always said the more time we spend on the water, the better. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that we just spend time on the specific windsurf class that we are competing in. But for example, we can go out with a coach boat and just cruise around and look. But we could also sail different classes or go kite surfing or go surfing, anything on the water. Yeah, and I also do remember uh, like our swimming icon, Pieter van der Hogeband, he also, uh, he's also in the book and he told me like he's quite an idol or you're quite an idol from him since, uh, yeah, he, it, it's, you're such an example in it's all in the detail, right? Um, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> well, we, we talked about it in the interview as well, that you, like people who know you, um, you are, it, it seems like it's all easy and easygoing and happy, but actually you worked quite hard, right? I worked super hard and I think I worked the hardest out of the other Olympic competitors to, uh, to achieve my goal. But it doesn't mean if you work hard that you need to suffer or that it needs to look really bad or that you're not enjoying it. For me, through my whole career, I've always told myself and told others, if I don't love to go out windsurfing anymore, I'm going to quit because I do this for the love of the sport and for, for myself. There is not massive amounts of competitors uh, outside the windsurf community and there is no spectators. There is no big fat bonus at the end of the road. So you, you got to do it for the love of the sport and for the people around you. Yeah, and talking about that, uh, you also talked about like the struggle before you quit. Can you tell a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I quit uh, at the beginning of last year in 2020. And my, my, my last hooray, my final approach to my next Olympic Games in Tokyo 2020. But in my, uh, in my career, I had a couple of uh, wonderful things happen to me, which are called children. And I'm a very lucky husband. And um, with, my, uh, yeah, with my life going forward, I started to notice the, a shift in my attention where I felt it was necessary for me to be. And through um, 2019, I had struggles about, you know, it always, in my head, it was always clear that I wanted to go to the games of Tokyo and there was no doubt about it. I'm going, but deep, deep, deep down inside me, um, there was the energy shift and the focus of what truly mattered to me and my kids growing up and not being able to be with them most of the time uh, was very difficult and not being able to be a supportive husband as my wife has a full-time job was also very difficult. So yeah, the, the shift slowly pulled me away from the RSX class. Yeah, and the, the people like in the public didn't know about your struggles, right? No, I really kept them to myself because 
I wanted to figure it out by myself. I didn't tell a lot of people. And I only told like three people really close to me. And, you know, I just wanted to see, as we say in Dutch, I wanted to see where the ship would get stranded. <laughs> so um, I went through a, a three event selection process against my uh, wonderful teammate and competitive uh, ally, Kieran Badlu. And we had a knockout, uh, best out of three. There was all the world championships in the previous years. And it was uh, one all until the last competition. And then for my last uh, event that I needed to win to go, uh, it just didn't happen. It was very difficult for me to um, make it click, as we say in, in, in the sport world. Everything was there, I was fit, I was strong, um, I was going fast, but the law, I couldn't combine it all and make it a success until in my head, halfway through the regatta, I decided that, you know what, it's not worth it. I don't want to go to the games and no matter what, I want to I wanna go home after this to my family. And I made that decision by myself for myself, in the middle of the regatta, I didn't tell anyone. And all of a sudden, I started windsurfing very well again and started winning races and it was a big switch, but it didn't change my mind. Yeah, maybe it's also interesting to, to share and to go to dive a little bit deeper into your story because it started actually with a tennis elbow, right? <laughs> Yeah, I had a tennis elbow and this happened in 2019 uh, in Japan during, uh, well, it really came to the surface in Japan, but it happened beforehand in a, in a little earlier stage around May in a, that year. And the silliest thing, I had to change the foot strap on my windsurf board and I had to do it quite fast and I had to do it often for this particular board that I was sailing on and it's a it's a screwdriver uh, like this that's that was the movement that I made and yeah I, I, I blew out my elbow and I couldn't figure it out I woke up in the middle of the night with lots of pains and it was just really weird I never had an injury like that but Um, and I think this is what you're trying to get out of me. Um, in Japan, I had a conversation with a dear friend of mine that has been helping me in my uh, sporting career with um, mental, uh, you can call it guidance, um, but it all happens through quantum physics. It's I call her my hocus pocus lady. And with the quantum physics, there is no time or place. So she could be in New Zealand and I could be in Japan and she could work on me through a box attached to the computer. It's all super up in the air and like kind of weird. But um, she recognized that I, I had issues with my elbow and that there was a lot of struggle from, with, from within. Uh, and she also pointed out that in the aging uh, medicine from like a, you know, a Asian, countries, the tennis elbow uh, was stamped as a struggle, as a personal struggle of indecisiveness. And I knew that my tennis elbow, as much as I would take care of it, it would always linger along until I would make a proper decision for myself what I wanted to do. Yeah, and what, what did you do? Well, in the end, I did decide You know, I, I gave it a couple goes. I'm very stubborn and the goal of going to an Olympics is, you know, it only happens once every four years. So you don't just give up on that and think, ah, oh, maybe it's not for me this time. So I, I went through the pro thought process and, you know, I, I thought to myself, okay, if I go to the games, I want to go to the games to win another gold medal. So let's say if I win another gold medal, what then? What happens? Do I, all the, the most important things in my life, I'm going to question those. Will I become a better parent? No. Will I become a better husband? No. Uh, would it make me invincible that I would never die? No. 
would it make me a happier person? No, because I am already happy. I'm satisfied with the goals that I've achieved in my life on sport and career. And this will never not uh, this will add nothing. So knowing that I, I, I was in peace in my mind. Um, but nevertheless, it still took a little while for me to decide. It didn't uh, happen until yeah, the, the following year in February. Yeah, and I think this is also really inspiring. Um, yeah, to for people to read the more details from your story in the book. So, Dorian, thank you so much for joining us uh, for so so early in the morning. And, oh, it's uh, not that early. <laughs> When you have kids. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, and uh, stay in touch and uh, stay safe. Thanks. Thank you very much. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, meanwhile, Sarah, Marianne and Lev have given way to three other champions. And I would love to introduce you to my fellow co-editors, Vincent Gutebarsch and Gino Kerkhofs. Vincent is a former professional football player and played several seasons in France and in the Netherlands. He is chief medical officer in f for FIFPRO and together with Gino, Vincent conducts research at the Amsterdam University Medical Centers that aims to deliver better medical support for active and former elite athletes. Welcome to you, uh, Vincent. And Gino Kerkhofs became one of the most recognized orthopedic surgeons in elite sports. He runs his practice in Amsterdam and apart from treating patients, he's also chair of the orthopedic departments and the academic center of evidence-based sports medicine, ACES, at the Amsterdam University Medical Centers. And he's also chair of the Amsterdam IOC Research Center. And as you can see, I need to read it because it's such an impressive CVs, both of you. So Thank you. thanks a lot for for um, yeah, writing this book together. It's uh, such an honor to me. And then Marco van Basten. I think he doesn't need uh, any introduction at all. But for those little few, um, yeah, Marco is our Dutch football legend. Um, he became European champion in 1988 and is winner of three Ballon d'Or uh, trophies and wrote the foreword in our book. And Marco is going uh, to receive the first copy of our book. And Marco, it's a huge honor that you're with us today and that you're going to, to do that and you're such a supporter of our uh, amazing project. Uh, but to uh, begin with yeah, your amazing career, what was your secret to, yeah, to have such an amazing football career? and you keep practicing and yeah all of a sudden you need a little bit of luck and quality and then you you can become a, a good football player yeah did you dream of it like when you were young of course i think uh, you you need these dreams and also uh, examples uh, so i when i grow up i watched uh, football uh, in television with ajax and final and the, the the big years of the dutch orange team in 74 so These were my idols, and so you want to good, uh, you want to become as good as they are. So that's that. Then, then start. Then you start dreaming. Yeah, and like uh, Levchenko, I promised the people at home to uh, to uh, yeah ask you like uh, what Levchenko al already said about his posters from you above his bed. Yeah. Uh, how is that for you to hear that? Yeah, I had also. Uh, different posters <laughs> uh, <laughs> from not from me but uh, you know from the stars <laughs> at that time like uh, van hanegem or kruif and neeskens and all these big stars so that's i think the 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 young young kids need these stars they need these uh, examples to to start dreaming of a, of also a uh, successful career and uh, i think that's more or less how it works yeah what is your biggest motivation uh, yeah then that you want to become as good as they are and you want to become a good football player. Football is nice, football is giving a lot of fun. Uh, that's that's what you want to do every time, every second of the day. And then you continue and, you know, the better you become, the more success you have and the more success you have, the more you like it and you want, yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, and 
like eventually you um, your you had a career ending injury on your ankle. Yep. How was that? That was awful, but uh, yeah, that was part of the game. At, at in the end, uh, it was it was a sad story. It was a hard story, but uh, you know I was really on the on the highest level of, of football. I, we we won uh, European. Uh, uh, cups, we won the, the Italian league and all the sort of these things, but I was injured uh, with my ankle, so I needed a good doctor. I trusted the good doctor, and he didn't resolve the problem, and so I, uh, I kept trying. I uh, and we we couldn't uh, uh, overcome the the the, um, I see the injury, so all of a sudden after three years of uh, trying everything uh, I had to quit and then uh, I had to stop football so that was very very hard painful but it's another on the other side it's uh, part of uh, of the deal is that's part of life it can happen and uh, it's 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 uh, not how you wish for other people to end but it, it can also happen it's part of and you have to learn from it also and uh, I hope that a lot of others who are starting now, who are playing now, are uh, more uh, prepared and maybe have better doctors to help them to continue their, their career. Because uh, playing sport uh, is, is, I think, if you if you are as young as they are, you know, 30 years, 20 years, is the the, the most nice thing to do. Yeah, and talking about the physical and mental health, I think uh, Vincent, it's a, it's a yeah good moment now to talk about like where it all started. I remember the phone call uh, uh, like in summer 2019 when you called me. Can you tell us how that situation I was? I can because I remember obviously, <laughs> uh, but at the starting point was actually in 2018 when uh, Gino and I, we developed a medical examination for retiring professional footballer in order to uh, give them some advice, you know, uh, about the years coming after retirement, uh, because not all professional footballers know how to deal with uh, the mental and the physical change after a career. And uh, in that medical exam, um, Gino and I just developed a leaflet with some basic information for the player. And we thought, okay, it's nice to do. Let's write a, a medical book about that. But a few months later, in 2019, we thought, yeah, a medical book, again, it might be a little bit boring. Let's do something different. Let's write something for the athletes themselves. And when we were thinking about that, obviously, we thought about you, and we thought, OK, let's call Margrit and ask, hey, what do you think about that? Perhaps we can combine some medical information with some stories of champions in order to uh, make it a nice book that we can give to the athlete, and that was the start actually in 2018. We started with the book in uh, the summer 2019, and now we are uh, crossing the, the first finish line of our journey. That's right. And Gino, can you tell a little bit more about the medical chapters in the book? Yeah, uh, for sure, uh, of course. I thought it's, it's quite nice. When I hear Marcus' words now, then I think, uh, let's go back for that for surely, only 30 seconds, I suppose that uh, I was also a young guy in the Netherlands, you know, also dreaming about football, had, having uh, posters and uh, when uh, 88, when I was 16. Later, when you, you, you had to retire, uh, I was in my uh, medical uh, student times. So uh, I think uh, going back to that, the one good thing of his retirement was that I realized that we should be better as medical doctors. And a little bit further on, when I got, grew up a little bit more after my student times, I realized that it's not about the injury, but it's about, about the person who has the injury, who is called the patient. And, uh, and, and also athletes are like normal persons and can become a patient. So then you have, if you talk about the musculoskeletal part of the injuries, you have the inability to move as a human being, you have the inability to move as a person, and you cannot do what you like best. Uh, in Marcus' case, I suppose football, uh, in some other athletes, a, a different kind of sports, and in, in other persons, uh, not a, being able to walk. So that was a, a big uh, inspiration. Talking to Vince about these things, uh, we realized that then, okay, not only being better at treating musculoskeletal injuries or preventing them at an early stage would be a very good thing, but also to, uh, to have the holistic approach and think, okay, so what does it do mentally? Probably if you uh, open up and you 
make it possible to talk to a professional in the mental aspects, like a psychologist, um, then you help a lot more. So you also help to treat the injury and, and, and the person again. And, and that's how we came up with the eight uh, chapters, I suppose, that all have a particular part on, uh, on, on that specific problem, I suppose. Yeah, and talking about that, that medical chapters, Marco, is it for you difficult to, to talk about your medical chapter in your life? It's not difficult for me. It's, it's not uh, that I, I understand all uh, what you what what he has in his mind and, and knowledge he has. But uh, you, it's it's important for a patient to explain uh, exactly uh, everything you you have felt, and you can tell it to the doctor. The more you can uh, give, the more information you can give to the doctor, the better he can. Uh, uh, do his job. So uh, I think uh, it, in the end it will be an, uh, a job done by two. He is the one who is making uh, uh, the physical thing and I have to give him all the information, what I have felt, uh, what I have uh, yeah, experienced with my injury. Yeah, and I, I just can't imagine that when you're such in the the yeah, the, the highs of your career, and then you're laying there, and somebody, yeah, is doing something with your body. Yeah, yeah. It was it was also a very, a very uh, strange situation because I was in December '86. I was at, at the highest point you can ever dream about. Uh, we won the European Championship. We won the European Cup with Milan. We were uh, for the second or third time. We were demanding the the Serie A in Italy. Uh, I, I, I won the, the 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 how do you say the golden ball, and all these things. So, and I uh, had a discussion with the doctor, Dr. Mattia at that time. I said, okay, I had already a story of my ankle. So I said, okay, uh, if it, is it possible to make a nettoyage to clean up the, the ankle, uh, in order to to uh, play the next years with a little bit uh, uh, a better feeling in my ankle. I said, okay, we can arrange that, we will do that. So, uh, Don, uh, we, we uh, made an appointment in December in uh, St. Moritz, and he, was, uh, he, he had to operate my, my ankle. That's what they call a nettoyage, yeah, to clean it up. <laughs> and uh, after, he said after three weeks, but we tell the, 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 the outside world after four weeks, six, year, six weeks, you can play as new. As, as before, uh, without a problem. I said, okay, so that's, that was what, uh, what I, I knew. But I never played anymore because uh, something went wrong. He, did, he overdone it, or he, did, he didn't uh, do it right, I don't know. It was not uh, on purpose, but it, it didn't, didn't succeed. Was and it I, on a blue Monday? Or and I couldn't, yeah, I don't know, but it was on a, no, on a Sunday, and on a Monday, <laughs> <laughs> it was on a oh. Monday. <laughs> but uh, I, I never played, I had played one game against Ancona to try, and the final from the Champions League. Uh, there were two games that I played and I never played anymore. And so, so I, I went from the highest level to the lowest level. And the problem was, I, I, the problem, I couldn't uh, play football anymore, but I had also, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a burger, as a uh, citizen. citizen, I couldn't walk anymore. I was, I was really bad. I, I couldn't run, I couldn't uh, walk, I couldn't do shopping, I couldn't do nothing. So uh, in, instead of being a, a, a high uh, athlete, a, a sportsman, I, I went down to uh, an invalid person. So I had to, had to uh, struggle and I had to work and I had to fight for years, really for years, to get back in a normal life. I was operated in December '96, uh, and uh, was um, we had a made a decision? I think, uh, but I don't know exactly. But three years later, to uh, to um, uh, my ankle fuse. Fuse. fuse the ankle. Fuse the ankle. Yeah, after three years or something. Uh, so that was the the end of a, a, a good idea in the beginning, mm. and it, it worked out completely uh, the opposite. Yeah, and uh, Gino, when you hear this story as a, a surgeon, what what do you think? Yeah, quite some things. Never discussed it in private with Marco, so I'll so keep it short, I would say. I think the first thing that Marco said was uh, the most uh, truthful, and that is that the patient knows. So as a doctor, 
whether you're a surgeon or somebody uh, doing another profession, uh, you should get the information out uh, and you should be 110% sure that what you're going to do also uh, delivers on the expectations of the patient. So we, we're not going to travel back in time, but if somebody's at the very best of what he can do, this is a strange moment in time to do an operation with the knowledge of 2021. That is something you should discuss. I don't know if Marco did that actually with Marty, but, uh, but that would be interesting. And then all the, yeah, you know, uh, for a patient like in the Formula One, so professional football player, uh, there's no room for mistakes. And then the second second you think that, that for any patient you operate on, there's no room for mistakes. So then that makes it come very close to what a, a professional athlete does. Makes it interesting you know, for me as a surgeon uh, to do a good job and try to do a good job. But I suppose uh, also my profession developed over the years and um, as football developed and the other sports developed, I suppose uh, a, a little different approach as uh, the doctors are not the magicians and uh, should uh, prevent themselves from making mistakes. And, and the first step there is to listen to your patient very carefully. Yeah, and Vincent, I think then it's the moment also uh, uh, yeah, to, to share with uh, the people at home, we have a surprise for, uh, for our athletes, right? Yes, indeed. <laughs> because of course we, we did develop this book, not for ourselves, uh, but um, primarily for, for the athletes. And, and that means that thanks to the uh, participation of sponsors, namely the Drake Foundation, FIFA Pro, Pushport and ACES, we were able to compile this book and in the next weeks or months we are going to uh, offer this book for free to all elite athletes uh, around the world. And how it works, we are going obviously to, to work with intermediaires, with the union, who represent professional footballers, for instance, World World, but also for the athlete uh, commission. So we are going to get in touch with them in order to make sure that our book gets uh, to the athletes themselves for free. And I think this is actually the most proud moment that we can have, that we can have such a nice book given for free for the athletes. Uh, and I'm sure that many other people will uh, want to read the story of uh, Marco and Lef and Sarah and, and Marianne. And it's why we also have an e-book. And the e-book is also available uh, online uh, for a very limited price. And uh, with this money, it is not for profit. We are going to work toward the second edition of the book with some additional material, with some other content chapter, with some other interview. So all the things that we get, we will give it back to the athletes themselves. And it, we can be proud of it. For sure. And where can people buy it? Like the e-book and also for elite athletes, right? If they, uh, they can't wait, they're, yeah, like uh, you have the possibility to buy the e-book and where well, can they do that? <laughs> uh, we, we have, of course, a very nice new website, The Secret Balance of Champions. Uh, and on the website, you can have access to the e-book. And uh, we also have Amazon, which is a very uh, global platform uh, for e-books. And our e-book is there, and you can buy it there. Amazing. I think uh, then the moment is there that we are going to launch our new book, The Secret Balance of Champions, Health Challenges in Elite Sport. And we are going to do that by giving the first copy to football legend Marco van Basten. Are you ready? Go! Marco, this one is yours. What yeah. is 
What is your first uh, impression about the book? I'm very curious because uh, I hope that uh, in the future the, the, the bigger sportsmen, but, but not only the big sportsmen, also the normal athletes, the amateurs, they, uh, that they can understand that uh, you have to star, uh, stay away, far away from, from getting injured. And uh, these athletes, they have uh, told their stories, their feelings, and uh, they will uh, hopefully give you good advices how to, to, to manage during the, your career or even also after your career, how to, how to live, how to work, uh, to work with discipline, etc. And they will uh, hopefully give you good advices. Yeah, and you uh, wrote the foreword as well. Yeah. Um, but how are you going to read this book? Uh, with the same idea, I think. Uh, it's, it's always nice uh, to, to read a story from other people, to get their uh, experiences. And maybe with all these uh, new uh, stories, you can also improve your own uh, story. So hopefully I'm, I'm getting a, a, a better and a, a more wise person after reading this book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and to, to yeah, close like um, this, yeah, this, this section, like uh, what would be your most important advice on mental and physical health? Uh, listen to yourself, um, listen to your body, and also uh, open yourself for everything what also other people uh, give you as ad advice. Uh, yeah, trust your feelings and uh, yeah. Be, be wise, try to be wise as, pos pure as possible. <laughs> that, that's really wise. Yeah, yeah. Marco van Wassen, thank you so much. It's a great honor uh, to us. And then I will want to thank our partners, the Drake Foundation, Pushports, Asus and FIFPRO. And also I wanted to thank the champions in our book, the experts in the book, and also Konings and partners for this yeah, wonderful production. And of course, also you at home, and our friends and family for all the support. And by telling that I will, will take the, the bubbles and Marco can take the bubble as well. Okay. And like Vincent already told, if you're an elite athlete, soon you will receive an email. Um, there you can uh, enroll for the book. And if you just can't wait, then you can buy the book, the ebook, uh, on secretbalanceofchampions.com. And also thanks for all the messages and likes and shares on social media. Uh, just keep on doing that. We really love that. And also thanks to the press, because last week we already yeah, uh, saw and, and um, yeah, experienced all the interest you already showed. So thanks a lot. And if you want, or if you are a journalist and you want to know more about the book, just mail us and um, yeah, we will. We are love to uh, give you more information. So, people at home, thanks a lot for joining us, and um, yeah, enjoy reading the book and enjoy uh, finding your secret balance. Stay safe. <laughs>